you start to question your value. You start to question your self-worth. Like the more money you got, the more successful you are, and most people really do buy into that. But really, I just needed a break. What I love is helping people. I'm Julie Bauke, and welcome to The Evolved Career, a podcast where we help you determine what truly does matter most to you and how it can have a profound impact on your life. Today, we welcome Jody Thompson. Jody is the founder of Culture RX and Row, which stands for the Results Only Work Environment. She's a speaker and author of Why Work Sucks and How to Fix It and Why Managing Sucks and How to Fix It. I love this sentence that really explains the concept behind her books. It's not the work that sucks. It's the way we're forced to do the work that sucks. I think we can get an amen from probably every listener today on that. Welcome, Jody. Hi, Julie. It's great to be here today. I love your topic. And what I wanted to say first before we got started with questions is, you know, people in their lives want to do what matters most to them and they want to do what they love, but there's so many things that get in the way of that path. And so I'm really excited to talk to your audience today and to talk to you about this topic. Yeah, So and you're right. So the, 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 the two things that stop people is, first, they don't know what matters most. We get so confused by the messages in our world and through media and our friends and well-meaning others and strangers and Instagram and Facebook and all that, that we don't know what matters. Everyone says, I want my work to matter. And all work matters to someone. But the key is figuring out what matters most to you. And once you have that nailed, it's easier to really forge that path. Oh, I totally agree. I mean, I I believe that people start out in their careers with, you know, this feeling that there's so much that we can do and there's so much fun we can have and all those kind of things. But we get in an institutionalized system that, you know, we feel like maybe money and status and climbing the ladder is what looks like, you know, a well-lived life. And we give up our dreams or we don't believe that they can happen. And I see that all the time. I think we can do better. And that's why I wrote the book, Why Work Sucks. Yeah. And it, first of all, I've seen you speak. You're a fantastic speaker, engaging, honest, real. And I love the story about how you got to found Culture RX and how you came up with this concept of Row. Give us a little bit of background. How did where did this results only work environment thing? How did this occur to you? Where did this come from? Well, the thing about um, results only work environment is it started out more as a an experiment in how to disrupt. You know, how organizations work today, disrupted from a, a whole different angle. And I will tell you this, there's, there's a story that really changed me. And that is, I was, you know, I was just a, a change agent inside a large organization. And I had a senior leader say to me, you will never be a manager here. And I remember hearing that and thinking, first of all, it felt really bad. Sure. And then I thought, you know, is that what I really want to be? Do I want to be part of an old methodology in a tired old institution where I manipulate human capital so that we can make more money? Why did he say and that I thought to about you? That for a l- did he explain what he meant <laughs> by that? Yeah. So <laughs> what that meant was I'm too outspoken. I try to push change too much. I don't understand that the status quo works. You know, some of those kind of things I was too, um, want, I wanted things to be different. And so the way that I went about my work every day was I did my job, but I also worked really hard on seeking out what could make things better for people and having conversations and talking to senior leaders. And that bothered people. It bothered certain people that I wasn't staying in my lane and doing what I was told. Uh, that and is I've had just, that happen in other oh. periods of my life, too. So. What the, you know, the first time um, you hear that, like, you'll never be a manager, you're like, oh. And then, but but it sounds, I mean, how quickly did you get from, oh, to, yay. I, I, I'm not sure I want to be a manager if that's what it takes to be a manager in this organization. Well, I got to tell you, for the first 24 hours, I was pretty bummed. Because I took it personally. And then I stepped back for a moment and I thought, well, I don't really want to be that anyway. 
Yeah. I don't like the, I don't like the role. I don't like what it represents. And I have other things that excite me and, and make me want to get up every day. So I'm going to take that as a compliment that I'll never be a manager. And so after that conversation and after that 24 hours, what did you do differently? You know, it's an interesting question, Julie, because I started looking at things out of a different frame. So prior to that moment that I was told that I couldn't be a manager, I was seeking that kind of thing because that's what we look for. We look for how do I climb the ladder? And deep inside, I knew all my life, I've done a lot of different things. I knew that I was going to do something that really excited me, but I didn't know what it was yet. So I started opening myself up more to scanning the things around me, listening to what people wanted. I just sort of started thinking about it differently instead of how can I get that next job? How can I get that next promotion? I just let it go. And did you do that in, inside the same organization you were in? Yes, I did. Okay. <laughs> and you continued <laughs> to ruffle feathers, I'm guessing. I did ruffle a few feathers. In fact, um, you know, one of my favorite stories is when I started experimenting with the results only work environment, it was very successful. So in the uh, first three teams that we worked with, we saw engagement stores, scores go up. We saw productivity go up. You know, everything that HR is trying to do inside of an organization, we were blowing those numbers out of the water. So let's, and, let's back up for a second. Explain to our listeners what the results-only work environment is. Okay. So You and I know, all, but, you know, results, we want, let's bring everybody yes, else in. <laughs> so the results-only work environment has nothing to do with flexibility. And in today's world, people are looking for work-life balance, and they're looking to have control over their time. So the results-only work environment is a, is a foundation where each person is 100% accountable, and each person is 100% autonomous. Now, this is key, because autonomy means I'm self-directed and independent. I don't ask if I can work from home. I don't ask if I can leave early. I don't ask if I can, you know, whatever. It's not a permission-based, you know, environment. It's performance-guided. So managers aren't managers anymore. They're actually results coaches. And that idea of management, which is, again, if you look up the definition, it's the manipulation of human capital, that's managing people. And in a results-only work environment, you manage work. The conversation is about the work, and everybody is focused on the outcome of the work and how to measure that so that we know that we're doing a good job. You know, showing up and putting in your 40 or 50 hours every week doesn't mean you're doing good work. It just means you're playing the game. Exactly. So we broke that. <laughs> we broke that thing and rebuilt um, an environment where people feel energized and inspired, and they get to, you know, here's what I say, Julie, it's not work life it's not work life. It's work your life. Work your life. That's a results-only work environment. You're in control 100%. I love that. Now, go back to the story you were telling. Now that we're caught up on what Roe is, you have a favorite story that you want to tell. <laughs> <laughs> what was that story? Oh, oh so um, results-only work environment as an experiment um, was very successful. So we were trying it out with three fairly large teams. And I was, the teams were 150 people. And the results-only work environment was very successful. And I was very excited about that because some of the things that, you know, human resources are trying to accomplish in terms of measurable um, impact, turnover, you know, reduction of turnover, productivity, you know, all that kind of stuff, engagement, was just being blown out of the water. And I remember going to my performance review. <laughs> and... I thought, you know, wow, I'm doing a really great job. I'm doing large-scale organizational change. We're getting really good results, whatever. And I had a, my, the worst performance review I've ever had. And I thought, well, what is going on? And one of the values of the organization was having fun while being the best. And my manager said to me, you're having too much fun and you're making people uncomfortable. Ah! Uh, eh. Yeah. <laughs> I thought, what universe am I in right now? So then I, I listened to that and I was told that because I was making people feel uncomfortable, I had to go and apologize to all of the people in HR. 
I'm sorry. (laughs) (laughs) And what did you do? Well, that was a moment for me again to go, okay, there's something bigger that's being discovered here. And so I need somebody to have my back. And it was interesting because the head of global innovation understood what I was trying to do and had my back with the leadership. So I knew I was safe up there. But he also helped me determine when I kind of turn up the heat and turn down the heat. And when I sort of retreat forward back, he tried to help me navigate this kind of change because he said, you know, you're the one person that's actually making something happen. And I need to protect that. But you're going to you're gonna have a lot of um, difficulty. So, for example, I was called a zealot. Mm-hmm. And not as a compliment. No, no, not a compliment. <laughs> you're a zealot. You know, and I thought, okay. So I, I went into a little small room and I was bawling my head off. And I went to the person that had my back, the head of, you know, global innovation. And I said, they called me a zealot. And he looked at me and he goes, That is exactly what I was looking for. And I thought, what do you mean? He said, the reason you're being called that is because you're actually upending the status quo. He said, so I need you to just kind of lay low for a while. Let me deal with the top of the house. You just buckle down and do your job. And it wasn't a week later that I got that bad performance review. And they told me if I didn't apologize to everybody, I was going to be fired. So did you apologize? Please say no. (laughs) So now this is an interesting story. (laughs) I think you like this one, Julie, because I, at that moment, I thought to myself, you know, I'm not going to apologize to those people. You know, I started that attitude. And then I thought, no, something's bigger going to happen. There's something big here. And I'm going to do what I have to do to keep it alive. Okay. And if it means that I have to stand up. Now, the way I did it, though, was interesting. So instead of going around and one by one saying, I'm sorry, I called a big meeting with all of them in the room. And I stood up in front of them. And I talked about the dream. And I talked about what I was feeling and what I was thinking and all that. And that I was so sorry that I made it more difficult for them to do their job. Ah, brilliant. And so I was okay for a while after that. And I learned that things like simple things in organizations, like if a leader would come to me and say, I want to talk to you about the results-only work environment, I would say, I would love to do that, you know, executive vice president, but I'm going to need you to invite your HR generalist to the room as well. So what they were mad about is that I was going around I them. I see. Okay. And so I had to learn how to play that game in order to keep this alive. I I needed to play it better. And I needed to not take everything personally. And so I thought of myself every day. I'd walk in and I would think of myself as a Teflon pan. And the things that came at me would just slide off. And I would keep focused on the end goal. And I would be kind to people. Now that's, let's stop because I, I love that. I love that concept. It is so easy to take things personally and to lose sight of the ultimate goal, whether that's at work or at home. But the visual of sometimes you know, creating that visual and saying, I am coated in Teflon. I am wearing a Teflon suit. And no matter what you say, I'm going to smile and be kind and let it bounce off of me. It's easier said than done, but I, I like that visual. It sounds like that really helped you. It did. And it's not to say that I didn't go home at night sometimes and just curl up in a little ball and cry because it's hard. It's sort of like Star Trek when the, you know, the, you feel like there's all these things coming at the ship and you're all of a sudden you're losing power. And, and I felt like that. I, I felt like the shields were coming down. We're at 40%, we're at 20% and I'd have to retreat back until I could power myself up again. Because I'll tell you this, people don't want to change. No. Oh, heavens. And Right. They want everybody they else to change, kind though. Of change. Oh, yeah. But not, but not me, right? Right. And so what I was putting out in front of them is, like, everything's going to change. Like, the way that you look at your world and your life and everything is going to be upended, and it's going to be so much better. But the work to get there, people didn't want to take that on. And it, it disrupted the path of HR. So I was really making them, them feel so uncomfortable that I had to figure out how to sort of understand where they were coming from, even though at the same time I wanted to say, don't you get it? Yeah. 
Yeah. Don't you get that what you're doing is making it worse? Like, I just wanted to scream that. And I, I'll tell you, I had a couple times where I got pulled aside by senior HR people, and I was taken to task. And that's when I knew I had to slow it down again and take it easy and take a deep breath and know that it's a long game. And I can't make it happen any faster than it's going to happen. You know, I remember when I saw you speak, and it's been several years ago, and then read your book, Why Work Sucks and How to Fix It. Um, it's like I, the whole time I'm reading it, I'm like, this, the the results, the positive results of Roe are so, I mean, it's it slaps you in the face. You read the book, you listen to you speak, you tell your story. It's like, yes, yes, yes. And then dot dot dot. Well, we don't want that. You know, it's it's confusing. Yep. You know, it's 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 um to me it's common sense. But as they say, common sense ain't so common. And I think what we're getting into, what you got into was you were making people uncomfortable. And I've I've always said that people, you know, in, in the face of change and disruption, the first thing they do is try to hold on to what they have. And hold on, regardless of the impact on the bigger world or the bigger organization, we look to preserve what we have first. And that's just human instinct. And so here you are in this big organization, and people are, um, you're bringing up something that to you, it's like, isn't this great? They're like, uh, no. But but at right. some level, they may know it's bra- great, but their lizard brain saying, no, 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 danger, Will Robinson. This is, you know, this is, this is going to, this is going to rock my world in a way I'm not ready to have it rocked. And so at some point you had to get tired of swimming upstream and say, I need to take my show out of this organization and on the road. What was that moment like? Absolutely. In fact, I remember the day that um, Kelly Ressler and I, we sat She's down your with partner. our manager. She's your partner. It, yes. Yep. And um, we had, you know, we had so much success and we knew that what we were doing was not the business of this business, right? This culture change was for the world. It was something bigger. And at that time, we were a subsidiary of the organization. So what we wanted to do is we wanted to basically spin off and buy the intellectual property of results-only work environment. So we sat down uh, with our manager and talked about how we wanted to do that. It wasn't an easy thing to do because the organization was getting a lot of, you know, media hits for this, and they were getting, you know, just a lot of attention and advertising and all sorts of really great things about this work culture they were building. And having us take it out, you know, sort of changed that trajectory a little bit because Mm -hmm. the focus started to be on us and what we were doing next. But again, you know, the organization was not about uh, culture change and, and culture change for other organizations. They were about their own culture change. So they were agreeable to us uh, purchasing the intellectual property and taking it on the road, which was really great. And how many years ago was that? That was in 2008. Okay. Okay. And uh, what's the long, journey? Long what, time ago. What's the journey been like? So I will tell you this, and you can already see this, Julie. Selling the idea of a results-only work environment, which is complex organizational change, and it's disruptive, is nearly impossible. So people don't want you to say, you know, give me $500,000 to upend everything. (laughs) And no matter how you try to sell it, people know deep inside that this is real change. And so putting money towards that is, is frightening. And the other thing is for leadership and managers, it's most difficult for them because they see themselves getting unseated in their minds. So they've gotten to a certain level and a certain place by being managers, right? By being that thing that um, all the methodologies in the last century, you know, said what a manager needed to be and how you needed to act if you're a manager. And now I'm going to level the playing field. And now you're not going to have power over people anymore. Now, I don't say that in the sales process, but people get it on some level sure. that this is what's going to happen. And so I will say, you know, when I first started, I pictured myself on a yacht, you know, with people feeding me grapes. <laughs> <laughs> As you should you know be. I mean? like, oh, Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I mean, I felt that it, this was so big. How am I even going to 
handle it. <laughs> and it hasn't been that kind of journey at all, at all. <laughs> I mean, I can't tell you how many times I've wanted to give up, but you know, when I see what it's doing for people and for business and for community, I just tell myself every day, one cube at a time, one cube at a time. Yeah, yeah. So you're saying the paparazzi, um, has you haven't had to get security guards to handle the paparazzi yet? <laughs> I haven't. But you know, I don't have 20 million, you know, <laughs> Instagram followers. Yeah. But you know, given what are the younger generations want, and frankly, what we see is so do the older generations. Um, we want that that autonomy over our lives. Your message has to resonate much better than it did 10 years ago. Julie, I absolutely agree. In fact, I've started to feel that things are starting to pick up again. And when I say pick up, what I mean by that is there's a lot more interest coming from around the world again, where people are reaching out to Culture RX and wanting to know more about how it would work in their organization. You know, it's for a while, I think it just kind of went underground, but we're seeing another swell. And I think you're right. I think as the sort of demographics are shifting in the organization, organizations are realizing that the status quo just isn't going to work. And people are not going to stay inside that old institution and feel good about it and elevate the organization. So no, there's no. a lot more interest coming in. So you guys, sometimes you just got to hang in there. And yeah. One other thing that's so interesting is not pushing this kind of thing on people. You know, we've always known that people have to draw towards it and pull it. Because if you try to push it on people, they run. So from a sales perspective, you know, that's a completely different animal. Yeah. you. I mean, you. Uh, it's sort of like um, pushing a rope. Yeah. It's just, it's it's impossible, right? Um, you know, it's, it's interesting because in our practice, we see um, it, it's, there used to be millennials, you know, the younger generations were the ones who were saying, I want my work life to matter. You know, I want a bigger picture view of work and life. And those of us in the older generations would roll our eyes and we're like, ha, you haven't suffered enough. You know, you, you, you got to <laughs> right. be miserable for 30 good years before you're allowed to say that. But what the, the tide oh, has really turned lately, and we're hearing, I want my work life to matter. I want to man manage my entire portfolio of living. Um, I want to do that, you know. Now, whether I'm 25, 35, 45, 55, we get it. And I say the younger generations, they have the right idea, and we can learn from them. Um, and it's, it's, you know, it, it's, a, it's, it's across generations now, and I love that. Um, we've, got a, we've got some catching up to do. We've got some work to do. But I think the framework is there for things like this to take hold. Oh, I absolutely agree. And I think that you make a really good point. These generations that are coming in, so we have um, by 2025, 80% of the workforce, that's the last stat I saw, is going to be um, millennials. And they do care about how they live their life right now. Whereas the generations before, if you look more into the boomers and traditionalists, we thought about working and then we'll, we'll do our stuff when we retire. Right. That's when we'll do our hobbies. That's when we're going to live, Right. And today they're saying, no, I'm going to live right now. And so doing, you know, getting into the institution of work the way it is does not fit with that mindset. And they're, they're trying to play the game, but they're not going to, you know, start in a company and stay there for 25 years. They're going to hop around. But if you create the right kind of work environment, they, they will blow us away in what they can do. But we're tying them up. We're yeah. saying, don't look at Facebook, right, during the day. I mean, come on. And I, we're I, saying, <laughs> um, you know, sit in a room with a bunch of us in a circle and have a meeting when they're like, you just wasted two hours of my day by having to drive here. Yeah, but, but, but we have a ping pong table. Yeah. <laughs> yes. And we have a dry cleaner. <laughs> yeah. 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 So that's a whole nother topic, Julie. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> you know, and it's the stats on organizations that are patting themselves on the back for having unlimited time off. Well, the stats show that when an organization has unlimited time off, people actually take less time off. They absolutely do, because what yeah. they have done is they've used policy to create change, and they haven't understood right. the cultural impact of that, that when people have that are under that kind of policy and you're in a traditional workplace, you're right. People take less vacation. Why? 
because people that take too much, you know, are going to be looked at as slackers and people yep. that don't take enough are more dedicated. And there's all this stuff you can't figure out what's the appropriate amount of time. So everybody just doesn't do it. You right, know, we just right. don't do it. So here's it's my a big backlash. I love this statement I pulled out of something you posted on LinkedIn. An authentic row is, in its essence, a contemporary work culture built on the foundation that we hire people for clear, measurable results. Duh. Wouldn't, I mean, isn't that, isn't that what, I don't know. It's frustrating. I mean, that's brilliant. That's just brilliant. And it should be what we're all striving toward, um, but not so much. Yeah, but what we do is we say, we think that, but then we count people's hours and we track their time and we say, no, you can't work from home on Fridays. And then we institute, you know, flexibility programs, which flexible schedules and oxymoron. And it makes people crazy. Talk to me about sludge so because think- I love sludge. I love the concept of sludge. And it's, it's, it's something that you have to deal with if you're going to implement a row culture. Tell us what sludge is. Yeah, sludge is actually the um, disruptive strategy. So we call it the sludge eradication strategy. And sludge is judging how other people are spending their time. So it sounds like this. Boy, I wish I had a kid and could leave at 4 o'clock every day. How did Bob get a promotion? He's never even here. Are you leaving early again? So it's, it's language around how people are spending their time, and it's extremely toxic, and it's not about the work. It undermines productivity, collaboration, focus, everything, because we're focused on trying to keep the status quo, right? Mm-hmm. And the status quo is 40 hours a week, everybody in the building, whatever that looks like, eight to five. And if you try to do something outside of that, the culture wants to snap itself back in place. So sludge or judgment about time is what does that. Yes, I and love that. We, we're breaking that. We're breaking that and getting that out of the work environment. So it's interesting to see that happen because it elevates the spirit of everybody when they feel trusted and supported. And people are not judging them and making them feel guilty and sick to their stomachs and stressed out all the time. So are you saying if we treat people like adults, they'll behave that way? You know, that is true. That is <laughs> that is very true. And I've heard so many people say to me, well, that sounds like a workplace for adults. And I say, <laughs> yes, you know what? I mean, if people, if all they want to do is do time, and by the way, there's another place in the world that we do time, and that is prison. <laughs> If all they want to do is do time, let them go to another organization. You want people that are adults, that are clear about their measurable results, that get the work done, collaborate with each other, whatever that looks like. You don't have to tell them what it looks like, but you have to be clear about what the measure of their work is, and it's not how many hours they put in. That's an irrelevant and old measure. I I would imagine one of the things that, that is vital for a row environment to be successful is when someone is not meeting their goals, not behaving like an adult, you have to take action extremely quickly. Oh, absolutely. And you know, it's funny that managers in general, I'm in generalized here a little bit, but they don't like to have performance conversations. They want HR to do it. And the reason they don't like to have those conversations is because they get subjective. And in a results-only work environment, Every single day is about performance, and so it just becomes a way of talking every, with everybody. And so things like, you know, you missed that deadline again. Now, is your daughter at home when you're working? You know, that, that's subjective. Right. Whether your daughter's at home or you're jumping on a trampoline, you still have to get the work done. And so talking about the work is different, and it's, as a results coach, you find your stride there. So if I talk to you, Julie, and say, you know what, Julie, you missed that deadline, and, and that's a customer disappoint. Deadlines need to be made, and you have another deadline in three days. Talk to me about how you're going to get to that deadline. And then if it happens again, you know, it's another conversation, but you're documenting this. Because in a results-only work environment, it's about one thing, and a deadline is the work, and that's the result, and you're getting to an outcome for the customer. So it's not personal anymore. Right, right. I love that. Well, let's talk about you for a few minutes. What are, If we looked at your career from first job to where you're sitting today, what are the common threads that we would see if we looked at that? I think the common threads for me are I was always 
seeking to try to make things better for people. So, you know, from the very first jobs, I mean, my, um, my degree in college, interestingly enough, is uh, I had a fitness degree. I, I made my own major. And it was in the physical education department, but that was, those were the days when, you know, the whole fitness craze was starting. And I wanted to actually change what physical education looked like in schools because I hated PE. And so I took this track to learn more about how I could disrupt that idea of what physical education needed to look like, you know, the mm. presidential physical fitness award and all that stuff that made people feel awful. And that we weren't ready for. I can remember running, having to run the 600-yard run walk or whatever it was called. And I felt I hated it. And I was an athlete. And I wanted to know how we could make that better for people so they could live better lives. And so that's kind of how I started. And throughout the things I did, I was always seeking to figure out how I could drive that forward. So I started my own national fitness business and, you know, I'm entrepreneurial. So whenever I found myself inside of an organization and I couldn't make it better, I got really frustrated by, by what I was seeing around me and, and the sort of pain people are under inside institutions. So you have so a lifetime. through my career. Yeah. You're a disruptor. Yeah. Um, troublemaker, zealot, you know, all those words. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I, and I, I've learned, you know, over the last, you know, 25 years that sometimes you just have to sit with people and hear what they have to say and not give them the answer so quickly. And I think that's one of the things I learned because of every job I had, I kept thinking to myself, something's going to come together for me at some point in my life. And I'm not sure how it's going to come together. And I'm not sure exactly what I'm going to be doing, but I know that I'm going to be doing something that affects lives in a positive way. And I'm, I'm just going to keep open to that. And so today I feel like I'm doing that and finally doing that in a way that feels like me. And um, even though it's tiring some days and it's frustrating, I don't regret, regret a minute of talking to people about the results only work environment and trying to help business community and people thrive. I, I love it. What was the, uh, lo- what, what would you say has been the low point of your career? Oh, that's a good question, Julie. <laughs> I've had a few of those. <laughs> um, I think that I had one of my lowest points probably in the years 2015 to 2017. Um, results only work environment and culture are actually having a really difficult time. We were losing traction. Um, People were focusing on really hard on flexibility again. There's sort of that rubber band effect. And I was, my livelihood, because we have to make some money, right? I mean, in order to eat and. Sure. I don't need a lot. I just need to keep going. And I started to feel really frustrated. And I started to think, okay, I'm going to have to just take a job somewhere. I'm just going to have to take a job and ride it out until things start to shift. And I could not get one organization to interview me. So the universe was telling you, keep going. Well, it was telling me that. And the second thing, like the biggest things I've done, right, writing a best-selling book, you know, speaking all around the world on this, you know, this was really a big thing. But when they saw on my resume, that stuff, Mm -hmm. they're they're like, that role person is not coming here. (laughs) Like, I didn't even have a chance to, to interview. It's like Roe is a communicable disease. <laughs> right. It's like something you get, right? right? And it's not good. So I was really bummed. I thought, I have done so much, and I'm not, you know, 20 years old. Like, I have a lot of experience, and I have a lot to offer, and people won't even talk to me. And I had a real, that was really low for those two years. I thought, what am I going to do? I can't not be who I am. Right. And Ugh. I remember that feeling where I said, okay, it's two years into this. I'm, I'm, you know, chewing on nails and what do I need? Like, what do I need? And I just started being really calm and telling the universe what I needed. Love it. Yeah. And it was interesting because a 
a, a good thing came my way. I got a pretty substantial client and, and Roe is still alive. Yay! <laughs> yes, yes, there you go. It's, that, it's still you know, alive. People talk about like, like this is, you know, so woo-woo. Well, I told the universe what I wanted and it complied. There's something about clarity yeah. around being able to articulate yeah. what it is you want and need. And with most people, I find that when you say, you know, what do you really want in your career? What does ideal look like? They look at me like, you know, I've got three heads. And I, I'm just a firm believer that unless you can, unless you get clear on that and articulate it, you have, you know, you have a very little chance of getting there. You might stumble into it, but it's not going to be the path that it could be if you had been clear. And really, whether it's telling the universe or telling your best networking contacts or just telling yourself every every day in the mirror, the, the power of that is something that's too easily ignored, but there's nothing like it. Yeah, I agree, Julie. I thought when I heard other people talk like that, I thought, oh, that is so weird. Like, I'm not (laughs) going to do that. And then one day I just started doing it. And I actually put it on a piece of paper and I said it every day. And I said to myself, I don't know where it's going to come from, but this is what I need. Because the results only work environment is that important. And I have to keep going. Yeah. So I, I had a number, like I need exactly this much to keep going. And I I didn't ask for too much and too little, but I was clear. Yeah. And clarity it was the key. And you know what? It came. I was pretty surprised. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but you have to believe. You have to believe. And I think that's the other thing. If you have in your spirit or in your heart and soul something that you believe, that's 90% of it. I mean, yes. just to keep believing. And things are going to happen. Maybe not how you think they are. Maybe you're going to take sort of a zigzaggy path, but if you keep true to it and keep focused on it and know that that's, that's who you are, it comes to you in really surprising ways. Just keep moving toward. Right. Okay. So imagine exactly. you're standing in front of a group of 22-year-olds who've just graduated from college, and they, they're saying, I want my work life to matter. What advice would you give them? So... <laughs> If the, a group of 20-year-olds said to me, I want my work life to matter, I would say to them, then you have to take charge of it. If you expect somebody else to give you the work life you know, package with a bow on top, you're never going to get it. So what is it that you really want? And it's interesting because I told both of my kids this. People can make money, but... What I want for you, too, is I want you to do what you love first, because if you do what you love, the other things are going to come into place. So I have a teacher and a chef, Mm. and they're doing exactly what they want to do, and they love it. Do they make a lot of money? Not really. Do they have big student loans? Yes, they do. But the point is, is that life is, we don't know how short life is. We just don't know what the next day is going to bring. So every single day, it's making sure that you take care of yourself and be articulate about what you need and how you're going to live. And I also would like to say to to young people, you know, when you get inside of an organization, because you undoubtedly will, really talk about the results of your work. Try to avoid talking about sort of that... um, I, I want to work from home or I want to whatever, dot, dot, dot. Because those things are going to come to you if you move the conversation away from that and talk about the good work that you can do. Start there. And that's going to also strengthen who you are and what you want to do if you talk about how you can contribute. And that next generation wants that. They, do. they want to contribute in a bigger way. They, they want to make sure that they're making progress, right? So... I mean, I, I, I have to tell you, I think every day, oh, I wish this could go faster because it's so important for that next generation to create the world that they imagine in all sorts of ways, you know, industry and climate and government and all that kind of stuff that drives, you know, countries and organizations forward. Absolutely. And I, I just want them to not give up. And I want them to keep their voices out there. And I want them to be true to themselves and what they want to accomplish. And don't give up. Fantastic. Are you ready to play two questions 
One deep and one shallow? (laughs) Yes, I am. I'm ready. All right. Deep one first. What breaks your heart? It breaks my heart when people are unkind. It breaks my heart. It breaks my heart when people are, when people step on other people to get ahead. Yes. It breaks my heart when there's, you know, it just, when there's unkindness. Yes. I just think that we could move everything so much more forward in the entire world if we all looked at each other as just people. Yes. Well said. Okay. So, Shallow, if you were arrested, what would your friends and family assume it was for? (laughs) If I were arrested, they would assume, oh my gosh, that's the shallow one? Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, okay. If I were arrested, my friends and family would think it was because I broke a law that I didn't think was fair. Yep. You are a troublemaker. I like that about you. Troublemaker. Badass. No. (laughs) No, that's good. (laughs) That's good. You know, I I highly recommend your books. I really do. Um, I've read them. They are fun. They're just like listening to you talk, which to me is a good writer. Uh, Good examples and stories and real hard results about that really support what we've talked about today. And I I encourage anyone to pick it up and read it and figure out how they can start to think differently about that, how they how they run their workplace. Um, so both of your books, I'm assuming, are available on Amazon and any place else fabulous books are sold, as we used to say. Um, and you are also a professional speaker available to come in and talk to people about how to how to, about what row is and how to step into it um, in a pace that's maybe comfortable for you. And um, how else might we get in touch with you? Well, people can absolutely go to our website. It's goroe.com and reach us through our contact. G-O-R-O-E. G-R-O-R-O-W-E.com. Okay. okay. And that's probably the best place to, to find us. And um, I encourage people to Check out our website, learn more about the results-only work environment, and let's make Row the status quo. Yes, yes. Amen to that, sister. Amen. Thank you so much for joining me today on The Evolved Career, and um, I'm sure you've piqued a lot of interest among our listeners, uh, either in how they can do it in their workplace, um, if they're leaders of workplaces, or um, how they might inspire their workplaces to to take this on. I mean, obviously, attracting and retaining great people is something that everybody's gnashing their teeth over. And as far as you're, you're concerned and I'm concerned, Road would be a great way to start that journey. I agree. Thank I you. Agree. Thanks, Jody. i um, talking with you today, Julie. Thank, Thank you. you. If you enjoyed meeting the Evolved Careerist on today's episode, well, we've got a lot more lined up for you. Subscribe, tell your friends, rate us, and write a review. And of course, follow us on social media. But if you're interested in learning more about how you can evolve your career, you can contact us through theevolvedcareer.com or thebaukegroup.com. And that's B-A-U-K-E. Do you know somebody who'd be a great guest who has a great career story to tell? Or do you think you qualify? Then email me. My email address is in the podcast description. Until next time, here's to your career happiness.